Okay, I, I think we can get started. Uh, so my name is Adrian Hoban, and uh, I'm Isaac Yamahata, and we're welcoming you here today to talk uh, about uh, networking and networking in an open stack context. Um, one of the things I guess Intel has, uh, you know, been a, a keen supporter of and contributor to over the years is about open standards. Um, and also open source software stacks in particular. And we're really excited to be part of this open stack community. Um, I think there's a huge amount of interesting things that we can go and work together on. Uh, there's been lots of talks already this week about SDN and NFV, so I'm gonna gloss over the slide pretty quickly. But when we think about networking, it's really the combination of these two paradigms. So when you think about SDN, it's the separation of the control plane and the data plane, and then that really is there to help give you the sort of logically centralized view of your network. It also helps with various uh, innovations that you can introduce. On the NFV side, this is uh, more really about leveraging standard IT infrastructure. How do you move these uh, network functions into virtual environments? And then how do you deploy them on industry standard high volume servers? Uh, the combination of these two paradigms, they're quite distinct, but they are mutually beneficial. And that combination together offers great opportunities for innovation, for OPEX benefits, CAPEX benefits, as well as being able to produce new services faster to your uh, system. Now, in, in that context, particularly of SDN and NFV, oftentimes we think about that sort of top layer of um, uh, appliances, really, from a more of an enterprise side. So you might be thinking about uh, load balancers, firewalls, uh, switches, routers, those type of devices. But really, when you think about the, the whole gambit of things we're looking at from an SDN and NFE perspective, this, this other huge um, uh, section of the market that we're looking at virtualizing and deploying on. So it goes everywhere from the uh, wireline or wireless core, for evolved packet core type appliances, all the way out to the edge with border uh, gateway devices, um, and then right the way up in, even into access space. So there's quite a significant market here to, to go address. And one of the things we have to think about, and we'll talk more in this session, is what's the implication of applying these type of workloads in an open stack managed environment? Now, a lot of the thought process around that is, is to move from this type of environment. So this is where you've got uh, more of a traditional way of developing, particularly on those appliances I mentioned. So you go from this uh, very monolithic, vertically integrated solution. It's generally deployed on proprietary hardware and systems. And we want to try and move is to this situation over on the right-hand side. Where we're taking all of these applications, we're moving them into virtual machines, then deploying them on industry standard high volume servers. Now, a lot of the, I guess, the specifications around this are being developed at the Etsy and FE community. That's the European Telco Standards Institute. And that's a, a grouping of, I guess, the world's leading service providers and TEMs. And we're looking at what it takes to move these type of applications into this type of domain. What are the specification requirements and how then does that go and impact all the various standards initiatives? Now when you think about all of those type of appliances, they bring a very different workload characteristics to an OpenStack deployed environment that we need to think about. Um, in many cases, if you look particularly like wireless or, or wireline cores, uh, imagine the case for your, your cell phone call, you don't want jitter on that, you want a good uh, nice clean uh, voice connections, you want to make sure you have support for uh, 911 or 999 type emergency calls. So really what we're actually doing here is you're transforming a uh, country's infrastructure. And as a result, this is subject to lots of regulatory type constraints. There are a huge amount of standards that these virtual appliances have to comply with. You're rarely going to get greenfield deployments, so you have to make sure all of these devices interoperate with existing discrete appliances. So we've got to bring some considerations from that space into OpenStack. You move into this uh, uh, carrier grade environment then, and oftentimes, uh, I've talked quite a bit about high availability in an OpenStack context, and in many cases that's more enterprise and some uh, public and private cloud type high availability. The carrier grade benchmark for high availability is quite a bit higher. Uh, if you think about the, the service contracts they have with their customers, you don't want to drop calls. Um, and looking in at the regulatory side of things, there can actually be financial implications of certain outages. So you have to get this aspect right. Uh, we have to look at how we schedule in an OpenStack cloud. Uh, so for instance, it's not just about compute or storage or your networking. 
when you want to deploy a particular appliance, you need to make sure you've got all of three of those things working in unison. So I think the community has some work to do in order to try and move forward on that. Responsiveness. So uh, this area that I think we need to think more about is things like alarm generation, metrics generation. You have to be able to respond quickly to events in a system. If there is an outage, you need to address it quickly and within certain uh, boundary guarantees. Manageability. Uh, there isn't really good lifecycle manageability in it in OpenStack. So uh, Zaku is going to talk to some things we're doing there, particularly around uh, service VM related work. Um, when you do, particularly in this NFV environment, the service providers have massive investments in the higher layer orchestration software, things like operating support systems, business support systems. So while we need to work on how do we interact between something like an OpenStack environment and these upper layers. Oftentimes there will be a, there will be a few components between them, but nonetheless those, the requirements of integrating OSS, BSS downwards is going to impact what you need to do and the type of interface that we need to provide in OpenStack. Um, predictability is another characteristic we need to look at. One of the items in here, if you think about it, it's not just predictability of OpenStack as the environment itself, as the sort of management plane, but it's the predictability of being able to deploy workloads. So, uh, for instance, it's not, it's not really acceptable to say I'm going to deploy a VM and not really understand that that platform you're deploying on is suitable for it, is ready for it, has, has uh, various data plane networks up and alive and ready to go. Um, the next two are kind of talk about those together because um, it's not just about performance and we can't just think about scaling out as a method to get performance and to get the type of capabilities that you need in the carrier environment. You have to combine high performance I.O. with predictability, with low latency, with uh, low amounts of jitter. So looking at these two things together is really starting to influence a lot of the thought process around some changes we have to make. Um, so. Collectively, all of this is going to influence OpenStack. Um, we're working with many of the, the folks in the OpenStack community, like, uh, for instance, Ericsson and other members of the uh, Network Cloud Builders program that we have running. So um, if folks are interested in that, please come up afterwards. We can chat some more about it. But ultimately, we're, what we have to do is now influence uh, the thinking around how we get some of these requirements into OpenStack, because it's very different from the sort of enterprise private cloud mindset. Zach, you want to? So, Zach is going to talk more on the manageability side. So, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, one of our uh, contributions to OpenStack. Uh, one of the key components of uh, NFB is uh, lifecycle management. So, we call it the Advanced Network Service Framework. Uh, uh, the scope of uh, in the in the Open Stack Committee, uh, there is um, several efforts uh, for to support NFB uh, with neutral networking. Uh, the scope of uh, scope of uh, NFB is uh, rather large, so there are several missing building blocks for uh, network function virtualization. So. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, key components is uh, lifecycle management. So we, so we are go, we are now contributing to it. So lifecycle management. Uh, 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 so, so far, uh, a neutron a neutron service plugin or uh, each service drive, device driver uh, implements their own lifecycle management management. So uh, it increasing uh, development cost and uh, cost and uh, it uh, and the way to lifecycle management is uh, their own. So the interface is inconsistent, inconsistent, and inconsistent, and also for users, uh, users doesn't care or don't don't even don't know or don't know that. The service is actually uh, is virtualized or uh, physical, or, or physical. So uh, it is uh, quite uh, desirable for users uh, is able to manage uh, those services uh, with a uniform manner uh, in relevant of uh, the services uh, virtualized or virtualized or uh, 
uh, physical, physical one. Physical one. So, uh, so it, so it is, um, so it is, uh, so it. So it is uh, desirable to create a common code base uh, to provide a unified interface for lifecycle management. Uh, so that uh, for, for uh, vendors, uh, uh, it lowers the bar for vendors to provide virtual appliance. And at the same time, uh, for users, uh, it provides a, a consistent uh, uniform interface for lifecycle management. Uh, we call it this framework as uh, the advanced, advanced network servicing framework. So this block diagram, the, uh, this slide shows that uh, block di diagram of the framework. Uh, it consists of uh, uh, three, three main, main components. One, uh, one main, uh, main component is keep, is uh, takes care of life cycle management. This is the heart out of, out of uh, uh, the framework. It, it keeps track of which services, service VM is created and used, and it, it also tracks uh, which, which uh, network service are uh, used and how it is configured. Our next component is a REST API, so that uh, cloud administrators can manage uh, service VMs or services uh, through this unified interface. And the last one is uh, a communication, com communication interface. Uh, uh, here, uh, communication means uh, communication between uh, neutron servers and uh, service VMs and services. Uh, OpenStack servers is uh, owned by cloud administrators. Uh, on the other hand, uh, service VMs is owned by our cloud users. So there is a security boundary between them. So it is not so easy to communicate um, for, for, for them, for them to communicate be between, between uh, it, is, uh, it is somewhat difficult uh, for neutron servers and the VMs to communicate. So uh, let's have a look at how this framework works. Uh, let's suppose uh, 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 some uh, cloud users want to uh, publish their web applications. Uh, he, he has a web, web application servers, and it also, he, has, he also has a backend database server. Uh, before, he, he, before publishing, he, before, uh, publishing uh, the services, he wants to uh, ins deploy a firewall, firewall services uh, between public internet and uh, application servers and backend database servers for security reasons. So uh, the service insertion is requested. Uh, the, framework, the framework notices uh, there is no service VM available for firewall. So it, it talks to Nova to boot spin up a uh, service VM. So Nova spin up a uh, service VM. VM. Then uh, service, service agent in a within service VM starts up. At this point, uh, any configuration is not done. Uh, it is a kind of a blank state. So uh, configuration uh, that uh, user defined is uh, pushed, needs to be pushed into this service, ag service agent. So uh, vendor driver sends its configuration data to uh, configuration agent and it the configuration agent uh, inject the config uh, service configuration into the service beam. Then uh, service agent knows how to configure uh, the service. Then now so service is enabled and it's working. And also we want to in, in, uh, insert a firewall between public internet and and the application server. So this process is also be this process is repeated again. Uh, service VM is spinned up and service agent starts up. The configuration is injected into the service VM. Now, uh, now a firewall is deployed, so it is, not, it is ready to uh, publish the web, app, web, app, web service to the end users. 
So end users will access to this uh, deployment, like this. Okay. So uh, as as the uh, development uh, going on, and uh, now the discussion uh, in the community uh, goes on. So it is uh, raised that this framework is not specific to network actually. So it is uh, very benefit. Uh, it is uh, good uh, for other OpenStack project. So, uh, so uh, it is. Uh, it is uh, the discussion is going on. Going is going on to create a new, new project dedicated for uh, this uh, lifecycle management. Actually, in this. Uh, uh, OpenStack Summit, uh, it will be discussed uh, about this, and it, I think uh, it will be decided to create a new one officially. So uh, this framework will be moved out of a Neutron project. So uh, I think after this uh, summit, uh, the, incubation, in, in, the, the incubation process will start. So. Uh, so this uh, matrix uh, shows the uh, current status. Uh, it means what we have right now. Uh, basically, the implement implementation of uh, proof of com concept is uh, almost done. So I've tried to push uh, these uh, patches into ne to neutron upstream, uh, but uh, the, new the discussion on new project is uh, started, so the merging process has been suspended. For now, so a uh, new project will, will start is about to start. So there is a lots of to do. So there there are lots of uh, room for you to contribute this. So uh, please uh, join this project. Thanks, Zaku. So. Now we've talked a little bit about the manageability and lifecycle adding that in. I want to go back to what we talked about in terms of the performance and predictability and uh, sort of the traffic profile. So first thing to think about is, well, why would you even bother doing some optimization and configuration on the system? I just took a, a small sample of some performance data points that we've collected over time. That top left one shows the advanced encryption standard, new instruction, so that's uh, for crypto processing. This case shows it in an IPsec workload where the kind of bottom lines and the bottom line and the top ones are the difference between optimizing and tuning your system versus just kind of blindly deploying. Top right, we'll, or, yeah, we'll talk some more about on DPDK, the data plane development kit and how that drives the uh, IO related processing capability. Bottom left, if you're looking at some crypto related offloads or compression offloads, huge capability there for PCI accelerators to get involved. And on the bottom right, uh, another instruction set based optimization, so leveraging the advanced vector extensions and using that for some crypto workloads. So the key point of this is that there's a huge amount of potential in your infrastructure if you tune it and configure it properly. And in an NFV context, that's particularly important. What we really have to go do now is unlock some of that potential and make it easy to use. We'd readily accept that everybody isn't going to want to use this. It's not for every use case. But for some of those NFV ones that I talked about, they really have to get access to this type of material. If they don't, you're not going to get the type of performance that you really need to be successful. Uh, so one of the things we've got to uh, go do now is expose that um, these CPU and platform related features into Nova, into the scheduler to make sure that we can now provision based on workload uh, requests. Uh, so a brief look at the scheduler, just to put it in context. So really we've got a filter scheduler running in Nova. It's a, a kind of a two-part process really. There are 20 plus filters in there right now. The filters range from everything like host aggregates, uh, CPU load, uh, the, the disk allocation. Um, there's also this compute capabilities filter. And really you apply all of these filters, they're binary in nature, so it's a, a pass or fail. You can link them all together and based on that you come up with the right subset of platforms uh, based on your input configuration. Once you get your right subset of platforms, you go into a waiting discipline. And right now it's really RAM-based utilization that's uh, really deciding what order you try to uh, deploy VMs on those platforms. So one of the things that uh, we've released into ICEHOUSE 
and libvirt are some changes to allow the full CPU feature set to get exposed up through the libvirt layers into the Nova Compute libvirt driver. That allows the Nova DB to have access to the full range of CPU flags that you've got. So everything we expose with CPU ID, uh, you don't have to care about the instruction, but it gets exposed up through all the Linux and libvirt subsystems. The impact of all of this is now, if you know you have a workload and you've, you've gone to the trouble of either optimizing for a particular instruction set, or you've just uh, used some compiler optimizations and you want to identify a particular CPU, uh, CPU type or uh, generation, you can now specify that through the flavor. Uh, in this case, I'm showing an example, let's say if you wanted a, an ASNI for uh, some crypto operation, then maybe a PCIe accelerator for maybe some crypto offloads and you've got a, a really a heterogeneous setup in your network or in your infrastructure, so some with, some without, some a mix. So the combination in this case of the PCIe filter to find that right uh, PCIe device you want and the extensions that the compute capabilities filter can leverage can now get you to the right subset of platforms. Uh, then you get into the normal waiting discipline, so it's regular as is. Now, um, extending it like this does proliferate more metadata into the system. So there's a very interesting project in development called Graffiti. There was a talk on it yesterday, I hope some of you got to see. But the Graffiti could be a very interesting way to take some of this and up-level it so that it's more manageable in the environment. Now once you move on from uh, this feature mapping, so the feature mapping is, I, I have this VM, I've developed it for XYZ features, give me the right platform with that. Once you move past that, now you have to go and configure the thing properly. And really in an NFV and an SDN context, there's a huge amount of configuration you can do that gives uh, really incredible benefits to the workload. So uh, think of uh, NUMA, the non-uniform memory architecture we've gotten in platforms now with multiple sockets and it's different uh, speeds to get to the memory depending on which socket they're associated with. So what we've got to do are things like CPU pinning and isolation, make sure the workload exists in a place. We have to make sure that the host OS doesn't interfere with that for the VMs. We need to make sure we're not landing other VMs on this type of a platform that's going to move around and impact all your great configurations. There are uh, some interesting stuff you have to do around the I.O. devices, so make sure that you're getting I.O.s that are closely coupled with the CPU that you've decided to pin your workload onto. Uh, make sure you're getting memory close to that socket, that you're minimizing the amount of QPI, the sort of uh, inter-socket transfers that can happen. Uh, so this is all uh, work that's starting now. It's, we're going to target Juno, hopefully, for this. So watch out for some blueprints, and please contribute to them if you, you, know, you have some opinions on how we need to go on and develop this. But this type of configuration really does lead to being able to deliver on some of these performance and uh, predictability type characteristics that we have to go work. So moving a little out of that more compute-centric domain, if you start looking at the networking side, what we have to go do there? So uh, a lot of what we talk about, particularly in terms of the sort of explosion of that east-west traffic, uh, you combine that with uh, getting more and more cores per platform, and then in time when we do smarter, more sophisticated scheduling algorithms, because you have to remember east-west traffic doesn't mean on the same platform, it's typically within a data center. But if we get smarter scheduling, we can co-locate these because you've got the capability on a particular node. You can save on lots of uh, fabric-related bandwidth. Now your need for virtual switching and virtual routing capability or performance really goes up. So lots of great opportunities and challenges here we need to go work. Um, one of the things that uh, we have been doing is working quite a bit on the I.O. capability of um, these generic platforms we've got. These sort of industry standard high volume servers. What this chart shows is the progression of uh, 64 bytes of small packet performance forwarding data points. It's a really common one that a lot of the network um, equipment manufacturers would really look at in terms of determining how fit for purpose a platform is. And the type of uh, increase in throughput that we've seen over multiple generations here really does line up with the type of thing we've demonstrated on more of the compute side with Moore's Law. And so Really what this does is it, it opens up the opportunity for network vendors now to go and deploy on a single architecture with single tool sets to help to consolidate what they need to do. And you can stay on a, sort of a, an industry leading beat rate of microarchitecture and process improvements. 
part of the enabling for all of that is the software suite that you need to load. And one thing we've been working on is the data plane development kit. Now, DPDK is a, a collection of uh, utilities. At its core is this pull mode driver framework. It allows you to pull packets out of your NIC and get them into user space incredibly quickly, bypassing lots of potential overheads you might find in, in standard uh, networking stacks. There are a number of utilities around that too that are particularly important to leverage in packet processing workloads. So memory management, uh, queuing functions, and uh, flow classification. Now what we did is we released all of this with a really open license, it's open BSD license, in uh, I think it was April 2010. There's a new, uh, completely independent open source community has formed around this now. That's at dptk.org and Intel will uh, contribute to that too. But what we've done now is take some of uh, this DPDK as a foundation and try to apply it to the switching domain. So we've forked the openvswitch.org program and we've created this uh, Intel DPDK vSwitch. It's created as a reference architecture. We want to demonstrate how do you get the performance capability out of a, a DPDK uh, software suite and leverage that in the vSwitching environment. We're also contributing into the main line of openvswitch.org. So there are patches have been released in there now. So if you want to look at the head of that tree, you'll get to see some of that DPDK related enabling. And you combine that then with work that we're doing with a number of vendors to take some of these technologies and pull them into uh, commercial uh, switching and, and v-routing solutions. So we were demoing this this week. I think the demo might be closed now, but the performance we were showing was an approximate 10x going between a standard uh, open vSwitch, open vSwitch.org solution with a, a VertIO style interface uh, into the VM, and an Intel uh, DBDK vSwitch, the reference architecture solution. So with the DPDK type guest, it's a 10x type of performance improvement. So there's really incredible performance potential on offer. What we're going to do now is release the patches that we've enabled for that on uh, one of the Intel sites called 01.org. That should happen in the next week or so. Uh, we're going to take the, those patches then and start to upstream them through the regular blueprint process during the Juno cycle. So please watch out for that. The patches we're talking about uh, are really about the sort of initial setup and configuration of your vSwitch. Because this reference architecture for vSwitch, it, it's really a replacement of the forwarding plane. Uh, the standard open vSwitch control plane interface still exists. You've got OBSDB, you've got your open flow interface. But there are some subtle differences in how you need to configure that in your platform. So what we've created is some patches into uh, Nova into the libvirt driver in Nova. Uh, these target, uh, the first cut is the VIF bindings. So you're up in user space now, you don't have uh, the VEs uh, pairs that you would use in the kernel for binding between, let's say, the north side of the integration bridge you set up uh, and the tap device you want to create coming from the VM. So um, we're gonna bind that with patch ports, uh, just another uh, method of doing it. Um, the other thing we've put in here is huge page table support. So one of the performance uh, methods that we use with DPDK to get that uh, incredible increase is to leverage huge pages, typically one gig in size. So what we wanted to extend here is um, all of that huge page related memory in your platform, expose that amount up to uh, Nova and start managing the huge page and the amount of free uh, huge pages that you've got. Um, related work then needed to go into the regular open vSwitch agent. Uh, so this is more on the neutron side. Now the patches to go in here were to look at the binding between the, the physical bridge or the tunnel bridge you've got at the bottom of your uh, network on the compute node and the integration bridge. So again, this is all running up in user space, so you don't have to be pairs, so we've moved to a patch port uh, method. Uh, there's a couple of other smaller changes in there, like how you identify that this is a, a DPDK enabled vSwitch versus a standard one. Um, uh, they're all going to be released as separate blueprints and patches into the Nova community. Uh, originally, we were going to target a new mechanism driver for this, but we got feedback during the Hong Kong summit. You know, please work to consolidate it on, on this one vSwitch uh, path. So we've taken that on board, so all the patches have been updated to work on that environment. So I, I guess to conclude on it then, um, we're going to say that SDN and NFD, that it is driving this network transformation. And there are a whole set of new requirements that are going to come into the system 
that are going to need a fundamental mindset change in how we look at the, so the type of patches that are acceptable into an OpenStack community. Um, we are working with others to, to drive these changes. Um, I think we need to do a better job of consolidating all the work on that. Uh, I think there's a lot of great ideas coming through on NFE, but it's, I think we have to do more as a community to be cohesive and get behind some of the changes proposed. Um, there are some very, very, very interesting challenges here. So it's a, it's a great area for technical guys to get involved in and invest in. These are tough things to go solve. I think we can if we work together on it. Um, so I guess it's a call to action is to you know, work together, help make this a platform suitable for SDN and NFE. Okay, so any questions? I think all the results that you published assume trusted VMs, right? And uh, the drivers on the VMs have to be modified. You cannot use the standard VirtIO type of stuff, right? So the trusted VM issue is a big, uh, a big concern here. So how do you see this being addressed? So the, the 10X does leverage a, a DPDK-based guest, so you, you need to have that in there. But there is a model that doesn't get that quite uh, high performance as around the 3X using a standard VertIO interface in the guest. Right, so... Th there are other models I think you might be referring to. There's one called an IV shared mem model, which does require more of a trust base in your guest. But um, it's options, so you, you kind of pick and choose. If you want uh, really high performance, a DPDK-based guest, that can be trusted. No, uh, or, sorry, you don't have any right. trust concerns there. S so if the guest is not trusted, you have to go back and use QMU essentially in order to communicate to the guest, right? So the performance gain goes down to maybe a 2x or something like that, right? So with a regular VertIO interface in the guest, you have about a 2.5x performance right. improvement. Okay, thank with you. With a DBDK-enabled guest, yes. you, you still have security, uh, but the performance is about 10x. You can go faster again with an IP shared man model. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, hi, do you have any update on the SPDK program? Intel's SPDK signal processing um, development kit. I don't, I don't work on that okay. program. But okay. we can chat offline, I'll connect you to the right people. Thank you. Okay, folks, um, thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, please come to us afterwards. Thank you.